So it's a beautiful day today um, in Southern California. It's really warm, the days are getting longer, and when you were sitting outside having lunch, you may have noticed some birds singing in the background. And when you heard those birds singing, I'm sure you didn't think to yourself that these songbirds can teach us something about um, how our brains learn and explore. And so in the next 15 minutes or so, I'm going to tell you about songbirds and how they are a fantastic model system for investigating the brain mechanisms underlying learning and innovation. So the brain is a learning machine. Many cognitive skills and motor skills, such as learning to um, play a musical instrument or learning to play a sport, are not innately programmed, but rather are learned through a process of trial and error, and often after extensive practice. So when you're first thinking about um, a new problem or when you're trying to learn a sport, the brain doesn't necessarily tell you what to do. It can tell you if what you did is right or if what you did is wrong. Did you hit the ball to the right place on the court or did you totally miss? And so it's important for you to try out different ways of thinking, different ways of performing the motion, and through this trial and error and through practice, gradually you learn to master the skill. Now, one form of motor skill learning that you may not have thought of, but that people are particularly good at, is speech learning. Young children listen to the words of their parents and other adults around them, and they learn to reproduce them. And the language that they learn really depends on their environment, on what they heard while they were growing up. And our brains have specialized areas that are um, dedicated to learning and producing speech sounds. Now, in order to get at the brain mechanisms that underlie vocal learning, it would be really useful to have an animal model system. But actually, not that many animals learn their vocalizations. Sure, a lot of animals are able to vocalize, but they don't necessarily have to hear others or themselves in order to do so. Humans are the only primates that are known to learn their vocalizations. And among mammals, there are a few species of bats, whales, and elephants that learn to vocalize. But those animals are not really useful in a laboratory setting. <laughs> and so um, I'm going to talk to you today about a model system that is really useful for learning about, um, uh, about speech learning, and that's songbirds. There are over 4,000 different species of birds in the world that learn to produce their song. And vocal learning in birds shares many similarities with speech learning in humans. So initially, a young bird has to listen to and memorize the song of an adult tutor. And then that bird begins to babble. And at first, the sounds that he produces are really variable and immature. And he listens to these sounds and he tries to fix them. And through trial and error and through a lot of practice, he's finally able to produce a good copy of the tutor song. And so now I'm going to play for you a short demo of song learning in zebra finches, which is the birds shown in the upper right um, of the slide. And um, here I've plotted an example of the song of an adult zebra finch. It shows the pitch of the song varying over time, and zebra finches typically sing a stereotyped sequence of syllables, which we call a motif. And they repeat this motif over and over again. So in the song, you're going to hear that the male bird sings three renditions of the motif. OK, so now I'm going to play for you the songs of um, a juvenile bird during the process of learning. And he's trying to learn this tutor song. So the first sounds you'll hear are him babbling. And the um, sounds that he makes are really variable, and he seems to go on and on and on without pausing. OK, so now you'll hear him partway through learning. He's going to break his song up into chunks. OK, now you hear that he's close to mastering this skill. And I'm just going to play the tutor song one more time for you. OK, so I hope you could hear that this bird was actually able to produce a good copy of the tutor song. Not only are songbirds vocal learners, but like humans, they have specialized areas in their brain that um, subserve this behavior. And these areas are collectively known as the song system, and they share many similarities with brain structures in mammals. And this song system consists of two pathways. There's a motor pathway, shown here in gray. It's necessary throughout life for the bird to sing. And then there's a second pathway, shown in orange, that is a cortical basal ganglia circuit. And this circuit is required for song learning and for song plasticity. 
Now, cortical basal ganglia circuits are brain loops that are common across all vertebrates, and they're important for learning and producing sequenced motor acts, for learning in response to reward, and they're also the site of many psychiatric and neurological diseases. And damage to the circuit often results in motor deficits, such as um, the paucity of movements in Parkinson's disease or um, too many movements in Huntington's disease. Now, in songbirds, this circuit has been carved out of the surrounding brain areas and is specialized for one behavior, singing. And this, makes, this really simplifies the link between brain and behavior and allows us to ask what is happening in the brain, what's happening in the circuit, um, and how does it relate to the behavior. So previous studies have shown that this circuit is required for song learning and song plasticity. Now remember, I told you earlier that a zebra finch tends to sing a stereotyped sequence of syllables over and over again. He repeats a motif. Many years ago, Sarah Botcher showed that if you damage the circuit in a juvenile bird while he's still learning, then um, the learning stops. His song gets stuck in its tracks, and he's not able to vary his song and try, um, and try out different ways of singing, and so he never actually learns a good copy of the tutor song. This circuit is also important in adult birds for um, changing the song. And if this circuit is damaged in an adult, then he also cannot change his song in circumstances when he otherwise normally would. So for example, um, under conditions of altered auditory feedback. So one of the advantages of having a model system is now that we can go in and we can record the activity of cells in this part of the brain and ask, what are these cells doing when the bird is actually behaving? And so I'm going to show you an example of this in the next slide. We've put some wires in the bird's head, and um, the bird will sing for us. You can see that um, I've plotted an example of, this, of his song in the top, and below is the activity of a single nerve cell in the brain while the bird is singing. Now, each of those black lines shows you when the cell was active. And you can see that when he's quiet, there's, the cell shows some activity, but that it increases its firing during the song. And because zebra finches repeat the motif over and over again, we can align this activity to the song and look at it across many different repetitions of the song motif. And that's what I've shown below. So now, each of these rows shows you the activity of a single nerve cell during one rendition of song. And I've plotted the activity across 60 different renditions or trials of the song. And you can see that the cell basically does the same thing every time. It fires at specific times in the song. So for example, this cell is firing at the end of syllable C every time. And so cells in this part of the brain have a characteristic pattern of activity that is locked to the behavior. Now, all of the activity that I've shown you so far was recorded when a male bird was singing to a female. He's in a highly aroused state. He's trying to court the female. But birds also sing in other conditions, including when they're by themselves. And when we look at the activity of the same neuron when the bird is singing by himself, we see that it is very different. Now, when the bird is singing by himself, there's much more variability in this activity across repeated trials. And the neuron also, seems, uh, the, the neuron also exhibits bursts of activity during the song. And this is only true when the male sings by himself. And it never, um, the neuron never bursts when the male is singing to a female. And importantly, I just want to remind you that the bird is going back and forth between these two conditions, between singing to a female and singing to himself. And, during, and while he's singing, this neuron, an individual cell, is changing back and forth between precise firing at certain times in song when a female is present and more variable burst firing when the male is by himself. So given these differences in the activity of this part of the brain under, dis, under different social contexts, we next wanted to know whether or not the song was different in these two conditions as well. And so we analyzed the song and focused on a feature that we know that birds learn and that's easy to quantify, and that's the pitch. And so I measured the fundamental frequency of individual syllables. And for you mus musicians out there, the fundamental frequency is like the lowest note on a chord. And so when we looked at um, the, very, the pitch of the bird song, we saw that when he was singing by himself, that there was a lot of variability in the pitch. So for example, in the syllable A, the mean pitch is at about 530 hertz, but sometimes he's a little sharp and sometimes he's a little flat. So it's like he's singing in the shower and he's enjoying himself and fooling around. But when a female is present, he cleans up his act. <laughs> and you can see that now his song is much more reliable, there's much less variability, and he's trying to perform his best current version of song for the female. 
And remember, birds can go back and forth between these two states. So now we see that there's a correlation. When uh, there's a correlation between um, the activity in the brain and the song. When the activity is more variable, the song is also more variable. And we want, really wanted to know whether these bursts and the variable activity in this part of the brain ge um, generate the variability in the song. And so to get at this question, uh, we decided to damage the circuit. And so we lesioned the outflow nucleus of this circuit. And this eliminates all of the signals that it sends to the motor pathway. And when we do so, you can see that there's, uh, the bird now sings as if the female is always present. He no longer varies his song. And you might have thought that when the bird was singing by himself, that the reason that he was um, making mistakes, the reason he was a little sharp or a little flat, was because he didn't quite know how to produce the song yet. But actually, this experiment shows you that, that, that this variability in his song is not a bug in the system. It's not a mistake. But there's this whole circuit in the bird's brain that is actively generating this variability. And when it's damaged, the bird is no longer able to change his song. Now, remember I told you at the beginning that a lot of cognitive skills and a lot of motor skills are learned through this process of trial and error and, and through a lot of practice. And so by studying songbirds, we see that there are these circuits in your brain that, subs that are generating variability that subserves this learning. But importantly, the bird is not a, a slave to this variability. And in fact, the brain can turn off the variability depending on the behavioral context, as when he's singing to a female. Now, all of these differences are even more obvious in a juvenile bird who's in the process of learning. So here I've plotted three examples of the song of a teenage male zebra finch. And you can see there's a lot of variability in the song. In the first example, he gets through the whole song. In the second one, he gets stuck and he stops. And in the third example, he stutters at the beginning, and at the end of his song, he seems to slur um, the, sounds that, the sounds that he's making. Now, this isn't necessarily surprising. He's a teenager, he's still learning, he's got a month to go before he's really going to master the song. But actually, we found that if you put a female in with this teenager, he can produce... <laughs> He really is able to produce a good version of the song, and he can do it reliably. So like teenagers everywhere, this bird knew more than he was telling us, and it was only, <laughs> and it was only when he was motivated and in trying to impress a female that he showed us what he really knew. So these experiments in songbirds, like the ones you may have heard while you're sitting outside, have taught us that the brain has circuits that are actively helping us to learn and to explore. And importantly, um, you can, the brain is also able to turn off um, the variability in situations in which you need to perform accurately. Now, so far, um, all of the experiments that I've uh, talked about have been in um, normal birds. And so we think that experiment, these experiments are telling us something about how the, no the brain normally learns. But experiments in songbirds can also help us understand what goes wrong in, um, when the circuit is damaged. So remember, cortical basal ganglia circuits are required for motor learning and for cognitive learning. And damage to these circuits result in a number of motor and cognitive impairments. So for example, um, if the circuit is damaged, it can result in too little movement, as, in, as with Parkinson, Parkinson's disease, or obsessive compulsive behavior disorders, when people get stuck in a particular set of motions or if they get stuck in a particular thought. And similarly, damage to these circuits can result in too much movement, as in Huntington's disease, or in disordered thought processes, as in psychosis. So next time you're outside and you're listening to the birds singing, I hope you won't take that song for granted, and you'll stop and remember that this is a complex learned behavior, and that both the birds and we have specialized circuits in our brain to help us learn. And finally, I'd just like to end by saying that most of this work was performed in the laboratory of Allison Dope at UCSF, and um, was supported by the NIH, as well as a number of foundations that are interested in how damage to these circuits result in both cognitive and motor impairments. Thank you.